Hello and welcome to episode 10. It is part two of Justice System Flaws. Now, if you haven't listened to part one, it's really important you go back and listen to part one. This is part two where I disclose a huge story time about it, but it's really important to hear part one, hear other examples of things that people have been through, hear all the documentation and evidence online that this happens all the time and lots of other things. And there's some story times in there as well. But this is just a whole big story time this episode. So it's episode 10, part two of Justice System Flaws, when police get it wrong. Let's go. I'm trying to think of ways of avoiding this. Let's just get it done. Rip off the band-aid. This is super hard. Like this is the one thing I haven't wanted to tell people ever because it's, it's horrible. But the ending is good. So let's just get to the ending so we can celebrate and have joy. Okay. I had left this person, a person I knew had been violent. And I have described some of those violent incidents like hiding and everything like that. I moved out. It was very hard to do because they had ensured that every item I had wasn't kept separate, that it was all intertwined in every little drawer, every little crevice. So Having not long moved in, moving out was a big deal and I knew that much of my things would be stolen, but it was worth it because it got to a point where, who cares, this is so unsafe, I need to get out. However, it's a whole other story as to why I was with them this day. I couldn't access my property unless I talked to them and they used the opportunity to groom me. Some toxic people I knew said, go back, oh come on, he's so good, go back, even though they had seen me covered in bruises. There is a long story as to why after I'd moved out, I was entertaining the idea of being with them, but not living with them, which is sickening. I might have to add that as a story time sometime. It will be a story time sometime. Definitely. That's actually distressing me more now. Like I want to tell you that side, but we really need to get into the nitty gritty of what happened. So I was, I think I had stayed the night there. And I was due to go home that day. And obviously this person did not like that or want that, but they didn't use their words. Like many violent perpetrators, they don't use their words to express their feelings and emotions and what they're thinking. So they just, they just randomly lost it. And it was during the day, which was odd. But because I wasn't living there, they couldn't, you know, they had to do their little violent bullcrap whenever they could because I was assessing if I would ever be back with them and they'd been sucking up and they'd been lovely and me and my children I will not give ages or times or anything away but I believe we had stayed there the night and we were going for brunch out for brunch to eat and on the way he just obviously he was thinking she's going home straight after this because I was And obviously he was thinking that and mulling over it because I know that other times when I was meant to go to work, he'd microwave my work ID and do aggressive crap to express, I don't like this, rather than using your words. And I was driving the car and he, like, everything was okay. And then he just switched and went really weird And I said, don't speak to me like that. And I said, what's going on? And he just was attacking like, you're this, you're that, like his usual. And things were okay. Like I thought they were okay. No, it was because I was going home that afternoon, but it wasn't an argument with this person. We never argued. He would just switch and start being aggressive and verbally attacking me and he did that and I was driving I said please don't do that and he escalated and I said do I have to pull over like are you okay and then he grabbed the steering wheel and nearly pulled us into other traffic I don't remember if he was pulling us into the car and then other lane going the same direction or into oncoming traffic I can't remember I'm glad I've shut bits out like it was he just grabbed the steering wheel and yanked it so I was then instantly terrified I pulled into like the turning right kind of lane and went into a side street and just pulled over keys out of the ignition like no we're not playing these games 
that was terrifying to pull my steering wheel into a nearly into another car and I quickly got off the road pulled over he did not like that I did that that I pulled over and stopped the vehicle because it highlighted that he had just been very violent and dangerous and you know when you respond to what they've done I did not pull over in any aggressive manner I did it very you had every move you had to do with this person you had to do quietly slowly you couldn't suddenly do something because then you would probably get smashed in the head like this person when they were like that you had to just move slow movements at all times but I pulled over took the keys out of the ignition like this is not happening that was very what you just did then was very dangerous that was still a response to what they did and it was a very good one it was stopping getting us off the road obviously he wanted us to continue driving what zigzag down the road and kill us I don't know what he wanted yeah I don't think they know what they want they just want that power and control they want you to feel that fear and of course I did that's why I pulled over I'm like I'm stopping this vehicle when we're removing the situation the danger so I pulled over and he just went off at me for doing that how dare you pull over why are you making a mountain out of mile? why did you just do that why did you drive like that like instant gaslighting and then I was like right I'm no and I said please get out of the car I don't feel safe please I just want to feel safe and I said it just like that calmly you know you can't have emotion with this one um no fast reactions no overreaction everything you say will be used against you so he got to a state of promising me no everything's fine you're safe you can drive and we started driving and I said well I'm gonna go home now you know, because I don't feel safe and that's just happened. I'm not going to go to brunch. I'm going to go get my kids. I'm going to go home. He did not like that. And this person, very, very strong person, punched my dash. I can't describe their physical features for identity purposes, but the entire radio was punched in the clock, little screen, everything. There was a massive crack and hole and everything was broken and busted. Like they smashed my dash. So I just, I'd started going down the road again. I pulled over and ran because I know this, this person thought, well, she's going to stay with the car. So I'll just stay with the car. She's not going to leave the car because then I'll have the car. At this point, I thought, I don't care. Take the car. I'm really, really, really scared. And I'm really not safe. This person has tried to steer me into other cars while driving because they, in their head they had an argument obviously in their head that oh she's going home later I don't like that and just started like on me for no reason and then when I said well I'm going home now because I don't feel safe well he saw that as an attack like me saying I don't feel safe I'm, I'm not we're not going to go to brunch anymore I want to go home and it wasn't I'm going home now or any petty arguey thing like that I was literally speaking like I do to patients like I'm going I do not feel safe everything's okay I'm just gonna go drop you off get my kids and go home okay everything's fine you know you have to talk to them like they're really not good and they see that as an attack like I'm not getting what I wanted in my head we were going to go to brunch and now we're not going to go to brunch that this person is so unwell that they just see that as I have slit their throat like that's what they see that as as oh, well, now we're not going to brunch anymore. How dare you? I'm revenging that bitch. Rather than seeing that they just put me in a lot of danger and did a violent act and I want to be away from them because of that violent act, they can't see that it's, for me, it's about safety. I'm not getting revenge or anything. I'm just, I want to separate myself from you while you're violent. I don't feel safe. But they see me wanting to now cancel brunch as a, planned calculated attack on them that they must now revenge that's the thinking that I've since figured out at the time it was a whole WTF moment so I abandoned the vehicle because I knew he was not he was not getting out he wouldn't get out so I tried I tried to get out and he grabbed me he wouldn't let me out he was now assaulting me I was trying to get out and he grabbed my body and pulled me back in and I I think I had to come back in and sit there and then I just 
quickly went to try and get out again and he grabbed my arm and he was really hurting it but I pulled away and ran and I ran down the street and I had my phone on me and I rang our emergency number while running away from him down the street and he was pursuing me he was running after me he'd left the car on the side of the road keys in it to chase me to chase me I am terrified so I'm on the phone while running like (laughs) while running calling our emergency number for Australia in Australia it's triple zero meanwhile an off-duty police officer sees this sees a woman running from a man looking very fearful I think my shoes were in the car I probably had no shoes running away while being pursued by a man who obviously would have looked very scary and aggressive he quickly pulls over and I'm still on the phone to emergency services and saying please help me he's running after me I want to get home I want to get safe please help me and he detained him and said I'm an off-duty police officer you stay where you are right now and leave her alone and I as soon as he pulled over I was like my knight shining army I don't, armor I don't think that now but at the time I was like thank you and I ran up to him like help me like because cars were going past <laughs> And then he saw this and he pulled over and I ran and he let me in his passenger seat and I just sat there in his car to get safe and get away from my perpetrator who was running after me and he said, stop. And I thought, yes, I'm safe. I'm safe. They're going to look after me. I was still on the phone to emergency services and then he got on the phone to his colleagues at work and said, come. And I was on the phone to triple zero so because he's trying to go home he's being a good Samaritan then the I don't know if I should tell you now what he did because I didn't know at the time well I'll tell you now months later the perpetrator when they finally had contact with me again or whatever I don't know this is like way down the track he bragged that at this point when the man got on the face said stay there don't move and he was standing up against defense and he did what he was told because he like he wants to be like imply that you know she's so crazy so oh I've got to comply or whatever so I can play the victim act or whatever so he did do what he was told and stood there and he later bragged that at this point when he got on the phone to his colleagues and was talking to them and saw that he was just standing there and he sort of turned away while on the phone that he used his keys to scratch the side of his face the perpetrator self-harmed he did this to himself with his keys or something on his key ring I know he didn't really have long nails (laughs) so this is what he bragged to me months I because I couldn't figure it out so just keep that in mind that he did that keep it in mind that I did not know that I'm sitting in the passenger seat and I had been crying because it was such a an emotional terrifying incident to have this person be okay and nice to you and then all of a sudden just steer like snap at you and steer you into oncoming traffic and you probably think oh you're probably arguing no and it's so weird it's so weird I don't know if he'd said why do you have to go home and I'm like well because that's where I live and you know why I've left you he might have brought that up while we were driving and that might have made him steer me into oncoming traffic just the thought of me not living with him something made him do it so I'm sitting there and then all these sirens and all these police come and they all gather around him no one comes near me at all not one person and eventually this man wants to go home so they come up and say get out of the car um he wants to go home and I wasn't allowed to speak to him or anything or thank him they were like come stand here we want you to stand here in the sun on the side of the road meanwhile the perpetrator's under a shady tree with all the police and then they wanted to leave me standing just in the sun direct sun this is like hot hot Australia direct sun sun I think some season that was hot (laughs) and I have a history of skin cancer I have really fair skin short term yeah for sure but no one was coming near me so I said oh is there anywhere shady I can go because you probably think if you're not from Australia you're probably like well why are you being so precious sometimes the sun like you can't stand in the sun direct sunlight here sometimes it's that hot and that like you can feel it 
giving you skin cancer like it's so bad so and it's really hot and you just oh, is there any shady patch I can go in somewhere so they let me sit in the back seat of the police car you know with my legs sitting out so just to get a bit of shade just you know with the door open and my legs out but they wouldn't speak to me and then they left and went over to him and everyone and then I saw them sort of like after a while like laughing and having like good chats and everything still no one talked to me eventually a man came over and he talked to me like I was a piece of shit like he spoke down to me he said okay what happened because they have to get my statement as well as his but they'd all gone over there and all got his I think because he was the violent person when they arrived they all went to him to make sure that was dealt with but manipulating manipulator got onto them but then they just kept standing there not realizing no one was talking to me and it's odd because I called triple zero and the man who turned up on the scene would have described what he saw so it's very odd anyway he came over and I said, so he went to steer me into another car. And he goes, oh, no, you did that. And I'm like, what? He goes, don't you mean you did that? You steered the car into the other lane to piss him off. And I'm like, what? No. And he goes, oh. anyway, what else? And he literally gave me maybe two minutes to give my statement and spoke down to me the entire time. He'd already been conditioned by the perpetrator to believe whatever his account was. I didn't know that at this stage because I thought, well, I'm the victim of called triple zero. So they're obviously trying to like calm him down because he's the perpetrator. Like it's so obvious. The person running down the road, calling triple zero, fleeing from their car is obviously and jumping in a stranger's car, knowing that's got to be safer than the situation I'm in now is obviously the victim right and he literally didn't even let me say much or anything and then I said how he punched the dash and it's all broken he's like oh, whatever like they didn't even go and look at the car they just left it there like no one looked at the damage that was so evident and oh, I've got to go quicker because there's so much to say and he just quickly like let me say a few things it wasn't even an in detail anything like he hardly let me speak and everything I said he kind of like mocked and he was so rude to me. And it, the good thing in Australia is they have body cams that record audio and vision on their chest. And that worked for me later on. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and they he went back and then I'm sitting there for ages, ages. It's a very hot day. Thirsty. <laughs> We're sitting there. And then a young woman comes up to me. And I don't know if she had other police officers with her or if she's just by herself. And she said... So I'm giving you this. You've got to go to court next week and you're meant to stay away from him. And and I was like, huh, what? And she goes, you're the respondent and you're go to, you've got to go to court. And I went, wait a minute, what? Um, how am I the respondent? I called triple zero while running away from him. And she was so mean. Like she was like, ah, like actually had that attitude and spoke down to me. Like she spoke to me like he was her boyfriend and her lover and I had hurt him. This is how good a manipulator this person is. I could not believe it. I did not know he was a good manipulator. And this is the moment that really taught me how dangerous this man was due to his ability to manipulate. And this moment actually saved me in the future by respecting how good a manipulator he was, it made me more guarded and tread lightly and not call police so many times I really wanted to because of how good a manipulator he was. And she said, well, you know what you did? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, oh, you scratched his face. And I went, what? What scratch? She goes, don't act stupid. You know what you did. And I'm like, no, I did not touch him. I peeled myself I had to fight to get out of the car to run away I didn't touch him at all I was pulling away to get away from him what are you talking about she said oh, you're just lying now and so I knew don't have emotion don't carry on don't argue I said I just want you to know 
you've made a mistake. I was like, I'm a health professional. I work with you guys. I recognize you guys. Like I see you guys through some of the stuff we do together at work. I am not trying to argue with you, but I want you to know that you have made a mistake. And they just kept talking down. And I said it nicely like that, like as nice as you can say when you really, you really want to just lose it and go, no, you've made a mistake, but they're not going to respond to that. So I said it was coming. It's like, like, you've made a mistake. They just kept, it was like she was completely enamored. The word that means she was just taken with him. And I heard, I thought, is she his lover <laughs> on this? Like literally the way she acted was like personal. It was, it was like I had personally hurt someone she knew or something. It was so odd the way she was so defensive of him and aggressive toward me. So then I said, can I go home now? Cause she'd given me this piece of paper that I had to go to court as a perpetrator, which was horrible, but you can't, you can't argue. You can say, I'm sorry, you've made a mistake and voice it. But then when they continue, they have the power. You can't say anything. So I said, can I go home? And she said, yep, and you'll drive him home. And I said, sorry. She said, you will take him home in your car. And I said, the reason I called police for help was to get safe and get him out of my car so I can be safe. And you're telling me to put him in my car again. And they said, you're the problem. Everything's fine. Just drive him home. And I said, I can't. I don't feel safe. And she said, oh, why, why you have to be such a troublemaker? And I was like, I'm not. I'm, I'm honestly, and like I was talking like this, honestly, I just want to get safe. And I looked at her and said, please help me be safe. And she said, oh, well, it's your fault if something happens to him. If he's not well or something happens to him and he can't get home, like he lived, he walked, he ended up walking home because it wasn't far from wherever he was. But she's like, well, that's on you. And that's really petty of you to not drive him home. And I was like, I called to get safe. I can't be in the car with him right now because I'm, I'm not safe. Have you seen the damage he's done to the car? And they went, oh, what damage? And just walked away like they wouldn't look at the car. So then I got in the car and I went to leave because I was told I could leave and I slowly got in the car and went to leave. So they were then getting in their cars and I'm assuming they have dash cams or whatever. And they saw him run up to my car as I'm starting to go to drive away. And he broke my window to force entry into my car while I'm trying to drive away. So then I stopped the car. I got out. And I waited for them because they then jumped out of their cars. Like, oh, gosh. And I said, he just broke my window. She said, look, will you stop being a troublemaker? Get in the car and piss off. I'm sorry if that hurt your ears. Just then when I sort of like yelled, but that's what she literally, she yelled at me to piss off. It was the window, like he'd shoved the window down and broken the window winder. So the car couldn't be like kept in the rain. We're getting, like you couldn't shut the window. Like it was, it cost, I think a 1200 bucks or something ridiculous to repair that the police saw it happen it would have been on their dash cams and everything they I mean they stopped and got out when they saw it happen but then they just kept abusing me and saying you did the wrong thing and they never let me apply for like anything against him damaging my car like I had a smashed in dash I had a broken window and his brainwashing and manipulation or whatever he was doing, his manipulation was that good that he could still do a crime, destroy my property, trying to force his way into my car in front of them. And they were still that conditioned that they believed I was still to blame and that I was just being carrying on and being dramatic or something. Oh, and then they said, and don't you dare go and get your children. They said, do not go to his house and get your children. He can keep your children. You're not to go there. Because he'd told them, I don't want her in my house. I'm really scared what she's going to do or something like that. You know, he was very good at that. <laughs> it was the biggest what the actual fuck experience of my life. Like, you're not only telling me to put my perpetrator that I called triple zero about back in the car. 
when every time he promised he was calm, he'd get back in the car and be violent again, endanger my life again. You're not only telling me to just get back in the car with him. Now you're telling me to leave my children who aren't his children. This person was not a parent of my children. Leave them in his custody. Just what, indefinitely or they were not his children. They were just visiting when I was visiting and we were just popping out for a bit before I went home. And they were um, having like play date kind of thing, but I won't get into, you know, who or what or where, you know, I'm trying to very be very guarded about identities. I was like, yeah, like hell. My children are not staying with my perpetrator. It was so weird. And I was like, that is one law that I'm going to break. I have a smashed up car, broken window, and now a thing where I have to go to court as a perpetrator of DV. You can do all this to me, but I'm not leaving my children with this man. Like this man wants to destroy. And when he is not getting his little power and control, do you think I'm going to leave my children in this? Per- like that, that was beyond. I didn't react because you can't react or they, you know, they were obviously hating me for existing. It was such a mindfuck. It was like, I'm sorry, am I the only human here? (laughs) Like, what is going on? The fact that he could do that. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, so I he was walking home. So I drove there, grabbed my kids, hugged other people who were in the building. Goodbye. And I got my kids and left. And he saw us as I drove out the main road, saw me leave with my kids. But it's like, yeah, go and tell the police I got my kids. Go and tell them. See if you can have, what, custody of my children? For what reason? So at this stage, I didn't know about any scratches on his face. I think, yeah, actually when she talked and then she got them to bring him over and said, look, these scratches on his face, look what you did. And I'm like, I didn't do that instantly. Like a normal person. I'm like, well, I didn't do that. And they're like, oh, how else did he get it? Hey. So anyway, yeah. So months later, he bragged that he had, when the guy, he said, oh, as soon as I heard the sirens and when the guy turned his head, I quickly turned my head toward the fence and used a thing on his key ring to scratch himself in the face. He goes, oh, worked. And he also bragged that he knew one of the police officers, but I don't know about this. Because years on, he would always brag that he knew when I was at the police station doing reports. And he said, I have a police officer on the inside who's feeding me information about you. And and he said, oh, yeah, on the side of the road, I knew one of the police officers. I assumed it was the girl and that they were secretly lovers or something because of the way she acted. But I believe maybe he was just tracking my phone. And so that's how he knew when I was at the police station. I don't know. You don't know what's real. You don't know what isn't. But. Anyway, so I was due to appear as a perpetrator. I found an online complaint form and I thought I'll fill it in, but I really had no faith in it. I thought it's just going to be like documented somewhere, like a lot of things, like no one's going to do anything. I'm so glad I filled that in. I don't even know what led me to it. I believe a DV service might have said, you've got to complain, like that's not right, like that's really bad. And I thought, well, who's going to believe me? You know, I'm a person and I'm apparently a bad person in the eyes of the police now. Who's going to believe me? So I filled out the complaint form and stressed that they were putting me and my children at risk. My children at risk by saying they have to stay with this perpetrator who's not related to them in any way, shape or form. Me at risk by telling me to get back in the vehicle with my perpetrator after I called triple zero while running down the road. I listed how no one spoke to me and then finally after speaking to him for some time and having a laugh for it was probably like half an hour someone came over and spoke to me maybe for under two minutes and mocked me and put me down while taking my apparently taking my statement and I mentioned the things that were done you know and everything and so what happens with the police service where I live is they get complaints and then they decide if they're going to follow them up and do an investigation or not and a lot of them they don't but this one was chosen so I had was going to court I was at court waiting and I had a call from the police, someone in the police um, station saying, we're investigating that and we want to chat to you when you're at court. I'll come over and get you that day. And they said, don't worry, you're not going to get an order against you because now that it's under investigation, it's on hold and he can try and get a temporary order, but he probably won't. And that's what happened. He tried to get a temporary order, but he didn't. While it was under investigation, there was just like, it was on hold. So I didn't get an order against me. 
at that stage. So it was adjourned or postponed or whatever. And they came in and grabbed me and not grabbed me. (laughs) They walked with me back to the police station and interviewed me about what happened. And she said, sorry. I knew revisiting the story would bring emotions because it's one of the most frustrating sort of emotional I mean I haven't gone into detail about being held hostage because that's a huge thing and but like yeah I knew I was avoidant because I knew how much shame you feel when you're told you're bad and you're the perpetrator by the police when you call triple zero running away asking to be safe and how on the scene I had repeated so many times calmly please help I just want to be safe I called you because I want to be safe help me be safe like reminding them that that's the priority none of this other stuff like whatever else was going on and whatever lies he had and on the day I thought what lies could he have possibly told what could he have possibly said to turn that around it didn't make sense nothing made sense so she got all the information from me talked to me and she said I am so sorry that happened to you and she said what would you like us to do with the police officers involved she said the female one was fresh out of the academy but there was a lot of them so there were senior ones there too like there was a lot so it's not like one made a mistake and everyone went oh okay they were all completely brainwashed gash lit manipulated whatever word you want to use by my then perpetrator and I said please send them for further training please send them for domestic violence training and that's when I found out they don't have any domestic violence training at that time in their initial training and there are courses they can do and she said yep we will do that we will make sure the officers involved are sent for domestic violence training I also said an apology would be nice from the officers or a written apology or something I said I don't expect it the way they spoke to me and it would probably I said it would probably be like a fake oh I have to say this thing but the most important thing was training so they never did it to anyone else again So what they did then is they went through all the body cam footage of every police officer present, all the dash cam footage, every bit of footage on the scene. They saw me saying, I just want to be safe, help me. And they saw that I kept a calm demeanor, that I had been crying, but I didn't carry on or get aggressive to them when they did make the mistake. They saw him damage my car. I At that point, I really should have said, I just didn't expect the investigation to help me. I just didn't think the police would ever admit that they made a mistake. So I didn't have much faith in it. I would have really liked to say, oh, can I now charge him with damaging my property? But I thought, don't push it. Don't push it. So I did it. I didn't ask for that. So I had to wear that expense. So what happened? She's like, yep, I'll do the investigation and yeah, we'll send them for further training and everything, but I still got to finish the investigation. So they watched all the footage and everything. Then I got a letter, I don't know, like a month later or something from the Queensland Police Service. I've still got that letter. Like it was very politically worded apology and confirmation. And it said, we're upholding your complaint that XYZ happened and many mistakes were made and they went against policies and procedures many times and many errors it means a lot to me even though it's very politically worded it's not just hey we're really sorry you know it's that's how a politician would apologize kind of thing because it is from my government but the fact that they're in writing is an apology that gross errors were made it means a lot so if this has happened to anyone go online fill out a complaint thing make sure you tell them the risks like did they put you back in a risky situation you know, what was the consequence of the errors made? Because that's what they're really looking at. And there's no point police turning up if they're going to cause more harm, which actually happened. Then I was still meant to go to court, like it had adjourned to a date. And I rang the police prosecutors and said, oh, I don't have to go to court anymore, do I? Like, this has been thrown out. And they're like, what? Are you down as a respondent to go to court? Yes. We will arrest you if you do not turn up at court. They spoke to me like that and I was like, I get criminals aren't really bothered by being spoken to like that because they're kind of used to it. But for like the little good girl, the little good Catholic school girl, that's how I was raised. Like the girl who tries to do everything right, abide by all the rules and just really doesn't like getting in trouble my whole life to be spoken to like firmly. Like we're going to arrest you if you do not show up. Of course, it's still going. And it was 
shouldn't have made that call it was horrible but the man who signed the letter so I found through his office and some contact to him or someone who worked with him or something somehow I managed to contact them in time and a man who worked there in whatever department that was the investigation land <laughs> I don't know he said I'm going to check this out and see if I can get you out of the court thing get you out of going because I said I don't want to face that perpetrator I don't want to go to court I mean what he can still get given the order what's the point in even go what's going on why is this not thrown out of court why send me a letter do the investigation send me a letter but then still have me as a respondent as a perpetrator of domestic violence going to court I'm not welcome in the safe room when I'm listed as a perpetrator I have to sit out with him like this is it's very distressing and this guy was so lovely and he said I'll look into it and I was like yeah will he (laughs) but he did and he got back to me at the 11th hour and said I I think maybe the day before or something and said yep it's off it's done you don't have to go to court we've thrown it out but I still had to fight like for that to happen as well but I'm so grateful for that so wow that's my story and so from that point on I would not call the police I wouldn't and later down the track yes he gloated that he scratched himself some people self-harm people with genuine issues I have much empathy for them but now we know that psychopaths or whatever personality disorder this person has can also self-harm when it causes an advantage to them and that is so sick he bragged that he'd scratch his face and convinced them I did it because I still thought well somehow he got a scratch face I don't know how he got a scratch face when he was trying to drag me back in the car but I can't imagine it and it's like being gaslit you start thinking well how would I have scratched his face if I'm pulling trying to get out of the car I can't remember that but he has a scratch face and he admitted it but it was like months later it was after all this had happened of course of course once he has power and control and like all that's passed and you know he didn't get the order and everything he and then he bragged that he knew one of them but I don't know about that maybe maybe not and he also bragged that he got very chummy with them and he then and that's when he also told me oh and I told them that you had a history as a violent woman and told them to look up your file and see that you had a cross order put on you you know all these years ago and so you were the perpetrator all these years ago, you know, and he'd used that scenario against me. And he worked hard to, you know, groom them, condition them, gaslight them, manipulate them. And, you know, and I said, and but I could see you're all laughing. He's like, oh, yeah, we got on really well. We laughed about a lot of things. We laughed about you. But we laughed about a lot of like, and he just said all this stuff. To, and he, he wanted me to know that he had scratched his face to say, look what I did. I can do that again. And that leads to that other story time I told you about how he wanted to get back in the house and he said, I'll smash my head on this wall. This is the incident he was referencing with that. I'll smash my head on this wall if you don't let me in. Because he said, they believe me last time, they'll believe me again. But he wanted me to know that he had done that intentionally and he had that power. And it worked. I did not call the police so many times I wanted to. I had a thing then in my head that I will only call the police if it's near death situation. And that's what ended up happening. And I I had an order and that's when the police got the order on him. So then she took me out of the room where she interviewed me for the investigation and she took me straight to this domestic violence police officer. She got them to do an order against him. And that was the first order, the original order against him. And they said, you need an order against this man. He's dangerous. And I was like, oh, I'm so scared. I said, he's going to get one back on me. She said, I don't care. We have to do this. And I was just so, she's like, do you want to? And I'm like, oh, because what happened when I was younger? They got an order back on me. But I'm glad I did get the order on him, although I couldn't really use it because of that. Are they still going to believe me? Yeah, so having that negative experience in the past, I was very reluctant to get an order on him because I thought, well, he's just going to get one back on me. The magistrates always give them one back on me. And they tried to explain, oh, it's kind of changed a bit now. And I'm glad it kind of has. That was a very long story, but I had to share it because it shows what can happen. I mean, that was ridiculous. But I've talked to so many survivors and there are so many similar stories. And word really, education really needs to get out to police about like narcissists and psychopaths and people like that, that 
arm manipulators and use manipulation and are manipulating the police. They really need training around that and at least follow their procedures of talking to both people and keeping people safe. Safety is the main priority. So I never got an apology from the officers. So if you do know a victim who has an order against them, do not judge them. Listen to their story, listen to what the truth is, because it unfortunately it's still a common thing that that can happen. Mistakes can happen and cross orders, some magistrates still believe in cross orders apparently out there, but they're changing slowly. So a lot of victims are given orders against them. So yeah, that's it for today. Oh, that was a lot. Next week is about the cycle of abuse. Don't know if you've heard of it. There's a lot to say about that. And there's also a circle of power and control that came out after the cycle of abuse. There are positives and negatives about the cycle of abuse. Cycle of abuse is a theory of how abuse happens. So thank you for listening today. Sorry for the heaviness, but hashtag sorry, not sorry, because it's really important to share these heavy, disgusting memories and life experiences to help other people. And I hope that it has helped someone out there. And if you've never been through DV, at least you know all this crap. So if someone you know and love is going through it, you'll have more understanding. And I want you all to be empowered to live a life free of abuse. Stay safe, stay empowered, have a rad, fantastic week, and we'll chat again next week. Love you, legends. Bye. Bye.